Uh, my title this morning is uh, A New Hope, and you know, we need truckloads of hope right now, don't we, across the world. And um, <clears throat> the last few months, uh, I've been like my younger friend here. I'll wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning, and um, it's been going on for a while now. So my wife knows the lights go on, the kitchen's being worked, and there's noise. So I've got to be really quiet, turn the lights down. You know. But I'm up at 3 a.m., and, and I'm, I have a real burden for the people of Ukraine. I have a burden full stop with the innocent and the oppressed. And uh, I've been up early mornings, just I'll read the news. I'm, I'm looking for a glimmer of hope for this country. For, it's a worldwide enigma, not just there, but um, the ramifications, you know. So I'm praying, I'm looking for news, I'm just looking for a glimmer of hope for these people and I, I'll pray it through. I'll leave it there, I'll go back to sleep. So I've been doing this um, for months now and, and thus my, my title, uh, A New Hope. But um, I came about the name of that because hope's been in my head for so long now and, and one of these sessions when I'm praying in the morning, I felt the Holy Ghost come to me and say, you know, Shane, you don't know the amount of prayers that are going up for these people. And see, this was the unseen hand of God that, you know, we can get stressed, but we, we forget what God's doing. We forget that he has a plan in this. He's their hope. He's our hope. And I'll never forget that when it said to me, Shane, you, you're not aware. You do not know the amount of prayer that is, that is going up for these people. And that gave me hope. That was the word I chose when the Holy Ghost spoke to me for this message. So today, I'll share my thoughts, my, you know, what I'm thinking, some notes, what I've been putting down over the last uh, few months. And um, one of the things I found that uh, when you see the images of what's happening there, and I, I remember one particular day, I saw an image of uh, a young boy and he's confused, he's afraid, and he's alone in the street, not knowing what to do. So my first response was sadness. I wanted to go there and protect him. The second one was anger, because who's there to protect him? And I can do nothing. And, and that, this is the human part of all of us. We've got to be careful how our emotions you know, are concocted and where they lead us to. And for a moment there, uh, I mean, severe anger rose up inside me. You know, Do I go there? Do I get a gun? I mean, and that's all being human. Of course I don't. But there was a, I was tempted for a moment that you know, if God hadn't blessed me with a family and, and I was single, I would probably go there. That's how strong I felt. And then I came to my senses as I kept thinking and praying. And I'm here for a reason, as we all are. And it's not about another man, another gun. It's about me praying. It's about more people praying. And to see that hope come through. Amen. You know, we've got to have, I pray for hope for our neighbours. We've got to speak hope to our neighbours, our family, your workplace. Lord, we just pray your hope. So, uh, my introduction. Oh, look at that. Um, regrettably, Star Wars is not a reality, and I know that will shock many of you. Uh, but funny enough, what is happening across the world right now is not so far away from that same thing. There are people who need hope, and there are people who give hope. That's my emphasis for today. That's my emphasis for today. We need to be givers of hope. And with the things in the world as they are today, my reason for this message no matter what entails, that there are people near us every day that are just on the edge. It doesn't matter where you go. You know, you could be in a shopping queue, the garage, the person right there, you know, you don't, we don't know what's going on. We just don't know what's going on in their life. And, uh, and as, uh, I think it's more widespread now than we really think it never was. And what we do and say has a great influence. Absolutely. Um, one particular little story I have for you is... Um, I had a call from a, a gentleman who used to come here, he's a Christian man, and uh, he rang me up and I said, hey, what's up, what are you, what are you doing? It's late. He said, oh, I'm at Mount Kutha, and I know he'd been going through some troubles. And he said, you know, I, I just don't want to deal with the trials anymore, I'm over it, and I'm at Mount Kutha, and I'm about thinking that I might drive my car straight over the edge and it'll be all done. And so, <clears throat> funny enough, that similar anger rose up inside of me, not for him, but for the enemy who wants to rob lives. And so I didn't mean to be angry or speak harsh, but I was perhaps a bit loud or maybe more so um, determined. So I said, hey, you know, I said, listen, whoa, whoa, you and I, you promised me that you would have lunch with me tomorrow. I might have been a bit angry, but it wasn't offensive. I wanted to, pre I wanted to preserve him. So I had to apprehend him somehow. I said, you promised me 
that you'd have lunch with me at Macca's tomorrow. What's going on? And it kind of got him off guard. He said, oh yeah, you're right, I forgot. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. And so, you know, you just never know when you're going to have to do something to change the atmosphere in somebody and speak hope. And, uh, and I thank God for godly intervention. I thank God for his Holy Ghost intervention to give us wisdom and clarity at, you know, at, a, at a drop of a hat to knowing what to do, amen? And I suppose I was a bit um, strengthy with him because I don't like to lose, you know? I don't like to lose and, and I don't believe in no-win scenarios. And um, we have a God that's above all things, so there is always alternatives, okay? Always alternatives, always options, and always a way out and forward with God, amen? We just gotta be out, we just gotta preach that to people. I, I gotta be able to tell it to my neighbour who, who wants to go up and is hopeless. I gotta preach this to the people around us, amen? We have to. Um, it's funny enough, um, my sister and I, a couple of weeks ago, we went to a, uh, into a shop to get some takeaway, and here we go again, another situation. And um, I went in there, and this particular day I happened to be wearing my army camouflage shirt thing, as you do, you know. Just, just do it, you know. And it's good because it's a conversation, it's an icebreaker for some reason. People always start something when I wear it, you know. And, and I'm not a violent person, you know, not at all. Um, just don't put me in a corner, but anyway. So we go in there and made an order and there's about 10 people in the shop and it's really quiet. And all of a sudden, this uh, gentleman runs out and he's got a bit longer hair and he looks you know, pretty nuggety and tough and intimidating. He comes running out and says, hey, he says to me, are you going to the war now, are you, with the Russians? I said, oh, no. He says, you know, they've got nukes and they're gonna be here shortly and he's carrying on and he's making a scene. And I, Why did he have to pick me? Like, there's eight other people, you know. So he's making this big scene and it's like, oh, heck. And so all the faces, all now, you could hear a pin drop, ching, and everyone's face is watching me to see what I, how I'm gonna react, you know? So I said, oh, hey, uh, I'm Shane, what's up? Oh, blah, 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 with the war and carrying on. I said, look, one thing, sir. I said, um, you look about my age, he was a bit more, but I wanted to be nice, you know? You, you, um, you and I look the same age, you would have lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis you know, the Bay of Pigs, he goes, oh yeah. I said, well, that nuclear threat was way worse than it is today. Uh, he goes, oh yeah, I said, you know, when Iraq invaded Kuwait and they threw Scud missiles to Israel, all the newsreels were saying, this is Armageddon. And it was trying to create fear. I said, you lived through that? He says, yeah. I said, well, look at all the things. You know, the Bible says there'll be wars and rumours of wars. Okay, wars and rumours of war. That's where we're at. I said, and secondly, I said, um, you know, he was spellbound by what I was saying. And um, I said, secondly, evil does not have longevity while God's around. You know, there's only a pleasure in sin for a season, but it has a time limit where righteousness will go on for eternity. But evil ha will have its day, but it has a time limit. You know, the, the Psalm 34, I quickly said to him, said that you'll find that evil devours evil. It will, it will devour itself. And we just have to stand back and watch it and Psalm 37 says, we just have to be patient and you'll see the destruction of them. And, uh, and so I said, look, sir, I said, you know, I'm gonna go home tonight and I'll pray about what's happening there. We've got to keep praying, you know, give hope to these people. And uh, so he said, wow, he says, yes, we've got to keep praying. God bless you. And he left and it was all over. And then they went back to the chips and doing things. But it's just... One of them opportunities where if you have an encounter, it's an encounter where when there's an opportunity, you just gotta take it. You know, when there's a break in the traffic, you just go for it and take it. So uh, these days I'm wearing my camo shirt everywhere I go now because <laughs> I love, the greatest thing, the greatest part of my ministry that I've ever done is speaking hope to people, okay? Saying, so you don't have to do that, this is a better way. And your God's word will just carry you through that. It'll carry you through it. And um, I just wanna speak hope. And my key verse for hope today is Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He's become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And you know, in all facets of our life, we need to see Jesus, this high priest, taking us through that curtain to God's presence into the Holy of Holies 
And maybe things could be different and for the better if we do. There's no greater order of priesthood, no greater hope than what God has prepared for us who trust in Him. You know, this new hope that I speak of, it's not new. It's been here for 2,000 years. We see the hope, our hope and glory, Jesus, His life, His death, His resurrection. But for some, we understand that, but for, for some, they don't know that. They don't know this message. They don't know it as we do. They haven't had the experience that you've had. They haven't heard. They haven't seen what, what you and I have seen in God. And so to them, this is a new thing. They have no understanding of the life and ministry of the Saviour. So to them, this is new. You know, the world is quite fragile at the moment. You never know what's going to pop its head up next. Don't be caught out. You know, don't be caught out. That's why I, as Pastor Sean has said, that, you know, if we're prayed up, we're ready for what comes up. You know what I'm saying? Don't get caught unawares. Don't think, gee, I should have been praying yesterday. I should have been doing this. I should have been doing that. Don't get caught out. With this message today, I, I would like, want to encourage you to be, not to be startled by events here or globally, but to steer our thoughts back to Jesus, the high priest who makes intercession on our behalf. Now, if Jesus could speak in our modern language, I think today he'd probably say something like, I've got this, I've got this, which he has. He was the one that went through the curtain. You know, he, he did all the work for us. He's got this. The world seems engrossed uh, in anything and everything but the advancement of their spirituality. And as they continually strive for material and material things, the eternal hope and glory, which is Jesus, is rarely ever on the shopping list. I read some uh, time ago of a pastor. Um, he had a call from a, ter- from a, a man in a terrible state, much like myself, and, which is going to happen. And he rang in quite late. He had serious health issues. He had some you know, big concerns in his life. And he'd been looking for help. He'd looking for, just how do I get through this? So he'd been speaking to other uh, ministers and ministries and churches and things and whatnot. And so this particular pastor was just trying his hardest trying his hardest to, uh, he, he felt he had to do something because he could lose this guy, you know what I mean? And so perhaps in working so hard, we actually work the wrong way. We're trying to do everything in our own strength. We're trying to rely on what I know more than what God can do. And so, so he, uh, in, a, in, a whole, in, a, in an hour, he would say, you know, number one, have you done this? And number two, have you done that? And Number three, have you tried this and have you prayed this prayer and done this, that and all the, and they're all good things, don't get me wrong. But by the time he got to about the sixth or seventh suggestion of counsel, this man just said, you know what, sir? He said, thank you. You clearly can't help me either. And he just put the phone down, hung up. And that was it. There was no more communication. This, the pastor didn't know how to get back to this man to say, hey, uh, can we keep doing this or whatever? But there was nothing. And so later on that night, the pastor, he's just walking up and down. He just realised him, just dawned on him. He said to his wife, you know, the only thing I never gave this guy was hope. That's all he wanted. He, so you don't need to fix everything. You've got to put hope as a foundation, as a starting point, and everything else just builds on top of that. We try to build on things and they all collapse because it's not based on what God is trying to do in someone's life. And uh, so that was a great learning curve uh, for, that, for that man. Now here's the challenge, beyond, the, beyond these walls, there are just so many people who could be liberated just by a kind word. A conversation about anything, even the weather, yet even the boring weather. People just need to know someone cares. And if you're talking about the weather, if you stay there and stick at it, it'll go to other stuff. But we just gotta be prepared. We just gotta turn up and be prepared to do it. I've never known a time where the ministry of hope uh, is so needed. The good thing is, you and I in this church, as we walk in the Holy Ghost with power, we are more than equipped. You know, you are more capable than you really know. You are more capable than you really, really know. You just need maybe an army camo shirt to bring it out, but you just need to give yourself opportunity to show what you can do. You'd be surprised. But uh, most of us, like I used to feel, you know, I'm not good enough. Uh, I don't know enough. I'm not equipped, I'm not trained. Uh, you just gotta be yourself. You just gotta be who God created you to be. You know, he created each of us unique with so many different talents and gifts and qualities that most lay hidden and dormant because we never bothered to, to use them. We never bothered to, 
throw yourself into a situation to see just what happens, you know? And when you do throw yourself in, you'll never be abandoned. You know, you'll never be abandoned. God will always turn up when you're in the cause for him. When you're fighting for the soul of somebody, God will always be there. He will, the Holy Ghost will always bring back to your remembrance what you need to do. It might be, hey, you, you said you would meet me at McDonald's or it might be a scripture or it might be both. But God will never abandon you when you embark on the souls of mankind because isn't that what he said? You know, it's his desire that none should perish. None should perish. So God will work with you he, tirelessly. He will never, ever give up. Like I said before, righteousness will reign forever, but evil has a limit. That's why I told this guy, don't fret. The Bible says, don't fret. Don't be afraid when you see evil men have their way because they will have their time when they'll be no more. Not that we speak harm on anybody, but when people step out of God's camp, there's not much there left. That's why it's important that we're hidden and abiding in him under his covering, amen? Um, I was blessed to have wonderful parents, as you saw on the screen before. And um, they always spoke hope to me and my sisters. And, and I think that when something is instilled in a person at a young age, you, you, it only gets better and stronger. And uh, with me, that was, we never had much as when I was a kid. Um, we weren't rich, we, we had enough, but uh, we didn't have anything that you know, you, we would have today. But there was one treasure that they gave to me was hope. You know, I, I, was, I was a bad kid. And you know, you probably find that difficult to understand believe. Uh, I was a bad, I don't know what the right word is. I've like, I was like the kid from, but I won't say that either. Um, but irrespective of what I did, my dad and mum always gave me hope. They never gave me words that destroyed my spirit. And I've carried that and I've nurtured that and I'm not perfect at that, but I always believe you must protect another person's spirit with your words. Now we have the power to, words have the power to curse and to bless and I've uh, that's something I've taken from my parents very, very powerfully. And um, being a bad kid, well, uh, I remember one particular day, I was only five, and back in the 60s, they just invented spray paint in tins. And uh, yeah, they had them back then, funny enough. <laughs> and I went in one day, I was bored, I needed something to do, so I found four or five tins of orange spray paint. I went to Dad's garage and I sprayed everything in there. Like, it was just painted the town orange, everything was just orange. And it looked great. <laughs> until dad came out and you know, he just, just shook his head. What can you do? I was only five, you know? And mum said, don't get angry, he's only five. And, but uh, it was instilled to me from a very young age and that's no excuse to, you know, to do things and get away with it. But um, my dad was careful that <clears throat> he could have reacted. He was a very big man and um, a big guy in all ways. And, but it, it, he, he knew the importance of the words he spoke and the effect that it'd have on me for the, for the rest of my life. And uh, my, my parents had a don't give up strategy. And they'd always find a way, uh, not just for their family, but for others as well. I've seen my dad just give hope to somebody in the sense that my dad had something, but he'd pass it on. So he had, my dad had none, but the person had. And I see a great principle in the sowing and reaping where God always gives seed to the sower. Don't ever be afraid of investing in somebody, whether it's your words, your ministry or whatever, because God will give you much more back. And there's a fear of loss when we want to uh, spend time with somebody or I don't want to talk to that person or whatever, whatever. We're the, we're the ones that lose the most. We are the ones at a greater loss when we don't invest in those things. Um, yeah, words, well, what can you say? I remember at high school, I'm just giving you a bit of a picture of my life. Is that okay? And uh, there's been 60. Actually, I'm not 60 yet. I've got three sleeps to go. I still have three days to uh, protect the universe, so there we go. I was at high school, and um, this particular class, uh, I, was in, I was in grade eight, and this, the teacher came to me one day, and she didn't like me. I probably shouldn't say she or her, but this teacher didn't like me. I don't know why. I mean, I was such a wonderful kid. But anyway, she didn't like me, loved everybody else but me. And yeah, I know. I, <laughs> probably because I was never there. When, her, when this teacher's uh, period came up, I was never there. And so that probably really rattled the cage of the teacher that I didn't bother to turn up to the, it was a history art class. Like what 15 year old boy goes to a history art class? Like, I mean, if there were motorbikes there, sure. Um, 
if there were no football there, I would, I'd have been there. But anyway, this teacher took a bit of a dislike to me and uh, partway through the day, the teacher said, looked at me and said, Weaver, you will never amount to anything. Oh, okay, so I said, thank you. I was polite. And, um, but I knew in my head it wouldn't come to pass. I had hope beyond the classroom. And if, if anything, those words spurred me on to prove it wrong. You know, if, if my dad and mum hadn't bolstered me up to know, have confidence in myself, um, those words would have destroyed me. And, you know, who, you, where would I go? I mean, I could have gone anywhere in life. Who knows? But the good thing was um, it had a, an effect on me that perhaps may be even stronger. You see, poorly chosen words destroy hope, but words of encouragement bring hope, life, and blessing. I mean, in the book of James, he speaks uh, powerfully about the importance of uh, words and how I use them and, and uh, what comes out of my mouth. And in James 3, verse 7, he says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and are tamed by mankind. Verse 8 says, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Proverbs 18, 21, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Words can bring hope or despair. And uh, I think of an incident um, in one of Indiana Jones movie. The, the point was, choose wisely. So choose your words wisely. There is, so much, there is so much ministry in the words that we speak, more so than preaching a great message. It's in our words that we speak. We bring hope. We can bring restoration in the words that we choose. Um, many years ago, I was called to, by the church to attend a serious situation and Pastor Sean was away at the time and regrettably, um, the parent of a young toddler had accidentally backed the car out of the garage and had accidentally um, run over the child and it died. I mean, boy, they're not the sort of things you want to attend to. And, um, but you know, everything in, we life, everything in life we do is ministry. And so the church asked me would I go there and it was about an hour's drive. I was kind of glad it was an hour because I thought I'll have time to think of what to do. Because what, what do you do in that situation? It's the most horrendous thing I ever, would ever um, face. So I'm asking my wife, what, what do I do? What do I say? You got any ideas? You know? And we both came up with nothing because there are none. You know, the little child had, had passed away. There's no words you can say. And because we're always conditioned that I have to go there with something, I have to do something. You know? I have to bring hope. I have to, I have to see, we have to, have to, have to. Well, <laughs> You know, sometimes hope comes in a, a package that you just don't know about. So I just went there and um, I saw him in the driveway and I didn't say a word. I went up to him. We just held for about five or 10 minutes and he cried and I cried, but that was my message of hope because, you know, the Bible says mourn with those who mourn, you know, grieve with those who grieve. He didn't say you have to tell them 20,000 words of something. Just grieve. Sometimes you just grieve and cry with them. And, and here's the thing, I went away thinking, gee, I didn't do a lot. I felt like a bit of a failure, you know? I was supposed to do all this stuff because this is going back a long time. And uh, I didn't know how to address it. I didn't know what to do. I went away thinking, he's going to think I'm a nut. But you know what? That was my perception, you know? We, we, that was my perception of what God was doing. And we can't judge how God ministers and works through people. And so, funny enough, you know, it's, it's, he's had more children since then and their life is great and they've come through really well. And, and the one thing I know that um, I was able to give hope that day was the fact that every year on the anniversary of the little girl's death, he sends me a message saying, I just want to thank you for being there with me. I just needed that. And you know, um, that was my hope restored. You know, I saw a different facet of how God can bring hope to people. And for me, that was learning as well. You know, um, sometimes hope is just being silent. Hope can be in a touch as much as words and it comes, as I said, in so many different packages. But whatever way we do it, whatever way we deliver it, you know, it's got to come from a heart that has been transformed by God, renewed by God. Because when you're there, you know, that there's a transference of the Holy Ghost will go to that person. That's how the Holy Ghost works. It comes out of us and it moves onto them in your words and in your touch. That's why we lay hands on people. You know, I believe there's that transference of his spirit and let God do the ministry. 
The ministry of hope is a powerful ministry that can transform a person from despair and to joy. It's about changing perspective and changing the way we think. You know, this is the old story of there's two men in prison and they both look out and one sees mud and darkness and the other man sees stars. See, it's all about perception. Stress and fear and anxiety, they're, all, they're so far worse now because uh, we, we see, I think we hear too much, we see too much and in our own strength, we can't do anything about it. It was like me months ago looking at all this news of Ukraine and I'm just getting frustrated and, and angry and you can't do anything about it. And so for that to go belly up, I need to get control of where my mind is. You know, you start thinking all the wrong things that aren't of God, like revenge and this and that, retaliation and all this. And so it's important that we take captive our thoughts when they, when you, when they come in in a heavy time of your emotion and whatever's facing you, because usually the first reaction is the wrong one. Usually the best reaction is to pray first and then see what God wants to do. Amen. Um, I see these uh, three levels of stress that we all face right now. And, and there's this one at, like, at a local level, like where we are in our community, you know, just outside the streets here. And, and I think that local level of stress is like well, my, my granddad, you know, 90 years ago, his worst day would be a, a wheel fall off his wagon, you know, or a cow escapes out the fence. But that was still stress to him. That was his livelihood. So I'm not taking that away. But at that time, he was protected because there was no Facebook. There was no social media. There was no news. There was nothing for him to just take in and take in and take in and become an unbalance in his emotions. Then there's a, what we face, the second, uh, the second tiered thing of stress is at our national level of this country. And, you know, we see so many political changes happening that it's hard to keep up with. And, and the one that I feel is the most difficult is we're seeing changes in our society that isn't coming from a godly perspective. It's steering us down a dark path. And what do we do? We hope and we pray that God will raise up leaders into the high echelons of government to maintain good and right principles. I can't march into the Parliament House. I can't go in there and, and give my rant and cause. You know what I mean? Oh, I could, but I'll be arrested. Nothing will happen. But um, that's, not, that's not the way to do it. You know, like I said, I could take guns and go to Ukraine, but then, um, you know, my greatest weapon is prayer. My greatest weapon is when I go to God at 3 a.m. When it's all quiet, when I go outside and I pray. And then that brings me calm knowing I can't do a lot, but I gotta keep praying for hope to be amplified. I gotta be praying that um, we as a fellowship will continue to speak hope to those around us because it's contagious. Um, I believe that when you encourage somebody and they, they get filled in their emotions and their spirit, something takes place and then it's an excitement that they wanna give to somebody else. So it's like a fire. But if we hold back, everybody holds back and then we're in this rut. That's, that's how I see it. I'm just sharing you my thoughts. But, um, and then there's the, the, the threat of a global level, the stress there, um, and the list goes on. But as I said, I have a burden for the innocent victims of, of everywhere. Uh, but I'm not stressing about it, I'm praying about it, and that's where I have to leave it. That's where we've got to go with it. We've got to, we've got to go back to prayer and not be disillusioned by what I'm seeing or what we're feeling or what's going on. And, and, part, and the biggest problem is you know, the news and the media. When was the last time you heard something good? Well, we don't hear a lot. It's very minuscule and it's never reported. You know, we are taught that uh, our GMN studies teach us that balance is the key and balance is the key to life. And what happens with all this social media is that uh, people are getting afraid because they're taking in, they're weighted down with so much, but there's only a little bit of God, a little bit of good happening. You know, it's good to know what's going on. I do, but I, I need to keep everything balanced. You know, I need to keep it balanced and see the good that God is doing in what's happening there. You know, we don't see what God is doing over there. We're just seeing this one particular thing. But um, it's important that we don't get unbalanced in what's happening in our life. And that goes for everything in life. It's your home, it's your work, it's church, it's everything. So my first point as I coming to an end, um, hope changes the atmosphere and steers us to a brighter future. And uh, just quickly, many years ago, before I came to work here, I used to teach young men to load trucks in the transport industry. And I, one particular guy came to me really distressed and uh, he said, you know, my work is, is, not, is not good. I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to stay. 
and everyone was, <clears throat> everybody was hanging on him as they do, regrettably, because he wasn't doing so well. So being one, I don't like to lose. <laughs> I don't believe in no-win scenarios. For me to not invest in this young boy would be another one that's lost. I, I can't do that. So it's better to try than not try at all. It's better to try and if they don't take it on, it's still a good day. And so I took it on myself to, I went to the office, I got him to work with me for a whole week and we were loading trucks and it was all bad because he was still bad. But I made a point that after every day before he left, I'd say, shake his hand, I'd say, thank you. You're doing great, awesome job, keep up the good work. And he's going, what? It's terrible. I says, you're doing good, keep it up. So I did this for a whole week. Bad jobs, bad jobs, thanking, thanking. So on the weekend, I'm thinking, wow, what if he comes back, you know? So on a Monday, he came back and that whole next week, his whole work ethic had changed. The trucks were loaded well, everything was fine. And I said nothing. He did all the work himself. And I'm not saying blowing my trumpet, but I don't like to lose. And if I can speak hope into something which seems hopelessness, it's amazing what God can transform when you invest and minister in someone's life. And you know, he's one of the best operators around right now. And that's a long time ago. Just by spending time with somebody, investing. And I was determined not to see him go, not to see another one lose. And lastly, be a deliverer of hope. The kind of wisdom, the kind of, the, the kind of hope is wisdom from above, not an earthly wisdom. You know, if we're gonna speak hope to people, it's gotta be something that you digested of God's Word and His presence a long time before. Something that you, God has invested in us that we can then share and give out. And the best Scripture that I have for that, and this is so incredibly important, and really without this Scripture, we really are nothing and can do nothing for anybody. Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. You know, I can't be of this world and then try to give them a piece of God's kingdom. I can't be a part of this world and give them something of God. I have to be, I have to be the, the recipient of God in my life. It has to come through me and then I give it on. So if, if I'm conformed to this world, uh, the world will just continue in the way it is. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that's the whole key. That's the secret, being renewed in your mind. You know, if you're renewed in your mind, you know the promises and the hope that God gives. You're not gonna worry about the fear or the terror that others are speaking and saying. You know, that's what we've got to keep balance. We know that terror is there, but the other side of the balance is that God is more powerful, amen? God, we have Him. Renewed in your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, when, you, when you're in God's presence and you're in His Word and you're renewed and you're transformed, you will speak God, amen? You will. It doesn't make us perfect. We can try to think, speak, and act like God as much as humanly possible, then maybe we'll get close to being a deliverer of hope in these trying times. They're exciting times, I think, that's my opinion, because we're getting so much opportunity to share God, to give hope to people who are saying there is none. And we know that that's not true. I'll start to close up, I think my time is out. I have a quote from Pastor Trevor Chandler, two quotes. And he was a great, uh, our spiritual father here for many years until he passed away. And one of these quotes, he said, ultimate hope is possible only because of a relationship with God that takes a person beyond the temporal and into the eternal. That's transformation. That's the renewal. Triumph in tragedy is possible only because a man or a woman has put their faith and hope in God. That's the transformation. There's renewal. If we can keep that, in our memory banks, you know, of how we minister to people. That's the key. Now for me to minister in hope, it's vitally important to know who I am in Christ. You've got to know who you are in Christ to be a deliverer of hope. It's going to be difficult to address someone's hopelessness if we're not entirely sure of our own position in Christ. If I don't care about my eternity, the chances are I won't care about another's. It's our hope and glory which gives us this joy and this drive. And it's important for our faith to revisit the joy of our salvation, to keep refreshed. Go back to those days when you, were, when you were born again, when you were saved and the impact 
you know, get the joy of that. Don't ever lose that joy because we lose the joy of our salvation. We no longer become witnesses of the gospel. Now it's my joy of my salvation means, you know what? I've got something that the world can't give and they can't take it away. I wanna give that away, amen? So in our daily journey, what sort of trail are we leaving for others to pick up? You know, when you go about your daily walk, whatever you do, work, home, church, what, what's the trail that is left behind? Is it hopelessness? Is it, is it negativity? I mean, is it offence? I mean, there are all these things and you know, we're all capable of that. None of us are perfect. But if, I'm, if we're gonna be people who are truly transformed, truly, re, truly renewed, there's gonna be gold left behind your trail, amen? We gotta, we gotta work at that. And if we leave a trail of God, we leave a trail of hope as people see us and follow us to have what we've got, a new hope. Amen, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I just speak over this church, Lord, over this fellowship, Father. And if there would be people here today that you know, are really needing that hope, they're really needing something to take place, maybe this week you need, you need God to show up. And you know, I personally can testify that in my most difficult days, God was there before me. He was ready. God intervened. He's never caught out. He's never caught unawares. Even in your difficult times, expect God to turn up. Expect it. So Father, I pray that hope, Lord, over this church, over families, over businessmen, Lord, over students, young people, old people, I speak the hope that goes beyond anything, any human understanding, that hope that passed through the curtain and into the Holy of Holies, where we all reside. So Father, I speak that over this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Sean.